As a clinician, I thought I understood food. Years of studying nutrition taught me about vitamins, minerals, and something called macronutrients. You know, protein, fat, carbs, all of that. Then I have conversations like this one today with Valerie Seacrest and Roma Jean Thomas from Feet 7 Generations. And I see how little I've thought about food's deeper meaning. The salmon are important because they tell a story about the health of our land and waters. They subsequently feed the health of our people. They will cease to exist if we don't take care of our water and keep climate resilience in mind. They're more than resources to be extracted from the land. They shape our culture, our way of life, the way we think about things, the way we see the world. They feed us their medicine in so many ways, more than just omega-3 fats and minerals. Hi, I'm Dr. Raj Sundar, a family physician and a community organizer. You're listening to Healthcare for Humans, the show dedicated to educating you on how to care for culturally diverse communities so you can be a better healer. This is about everything that you wish you knew to really care for the person in front of you, not just a body system. Let's learn together. Welcome back, everyone. We're continuing our Food is Medicine series today. Recently, I watched my kid munching on these bright red strawberries in the middle of winter. If you don't know, which my kids certainly don't, strawberries aren't really a winter fruit. That moment crystallized something profound. We've lost our connection to seasons, to the natural rhythms of growth and harvest. The strawberry that should taste like summer sun now arrives year-round in a plastic container stripped of its story. We've forgotten that our health is inextricably linked to the health of our environment. The soil that grows our food, the water that sustains it, the air that nurtures it, these really aren't separate from us, but part of a web that sustains all life. And this kind of understanding has been central to indigenous communities for millennia. In this conversation, my deepest learning came through understanding salmon. In healthcare, we measure food, for example, salmon, by omega 3s and protein content. But for the Coast Salish peoples, indigenous communities whose ancestral territories stretch across the Pacific Northwest, from British Columbia to Oregon, salmon as a teacher of generosity. Each year, these silver bodies return to ancestral waters, fighting impossible odds against rushing currents. They give their lives to feed not just humans, but entire ecosystems. This relationship carries an obligation. Protecting waters, maintaining cycles, preserving bonds that have nourished communities for generations. Part of this story is also about the statistics. The statistics paint a stark picture. 25% of Native Americans experience food insecurity, more than double the national rate. In indigenous communities, 35% of children wonder about their next meal. More than 16% live with diabetes, twice the rate of the general population. But the numbers alone is insufficient to really talk about this. This is where food sovereignty becomes crucial. The right of people to define their own food systems to grow and eat food that honors their traditions and nourishes their community. It's about access to food, and it's about control over how food is produced, distributed, and consumed. Food sovereignty puts power back in the hands of communities who have stewarded these lands and food since time immemorial. So what does all of this look like? Valerie and Roma Jean will talk about this today in this episode. Their work emerged from their deep understanding of indigenous communities, where food serves as a bridge between past and future, land and people. You'll discover food through a different lens, one that honors seasons, stories, and reciprocity. Whether you're a healthcare clinician, a parent, or someone seeking a deeper connection to what you eat, this conversation will reshape your understanding of food. As healthcare develops food as medicine programs, we need this perspective more than ever. Welcome to the show. Tell me about yourself. My name is Valerie Seagrass, and I am a member of the Muckleshoot tribe. My background is in nutrition, and I wanted to focus my practice in nutrition on a community level because I understood that coming back to my community, 
and lifting up nutrition science and specific interventions meant holding a conversation with everybody. I chose to focus my practice for the last 10 years in a community realm, taking an approach called food sovereignty, which meant listening to my community and helping find the solutions we need to move towards uh, a diet reminiscent of our ancestors that has upheld our health for a, a long time. This work has looked like developing food education resources and identifying areas to harvest and cultivate more foods, developing policy that helps support and strengthen our access to our traditional foods, and always keeping our future generations in mind. I'm Roma Jean Thomas, Muckleshoot Tribal Member. I'm currently the Program Director for Feed 7 Generations. I see myself as a community educator. I do food sovereignty work from the lens of being a type 1 diabetic. I co-teach cultural sovereignty with my dad, Northwest Indian College. We are in the classroom in a variety of ways and bring food sovereignty and the concept of food as medicine into the classroom as often as we can in our tribal communities. Thank you. The first topic I want to talk about is what is food? Some people's understanding of food is that it's a combination of macronutrients and micronutrients. There's carbs, fat, protein, and then micronutrients. They can put a nutrition label on a food. We're going to optimize that and everyone's going to live healthy. That is what often medical school teaches for clinicians as well. What does food mean to both of you? I studied nutrition at Bastyr University. I wanted to be a naturopathic physician. I had just completed a, a degree in Native Studies from Northwest Indian College and learned about policies that involved the forceful removal of our food traditions that were intentional and impacted several generations. And I also learned fun facts like diabetes was non-existent here pre-contact. In fact, there is no word in any indigenous language in North America for diabetes. I started thinking about the outcomes of colonization, what we now call epigenetics, the effects of the change of the environment on our health as humans. In my senior quarter at Bastyr, I took a class with a fabulous nutritionist named Jennifer Adler. Her class focused on therapeutic nutrition. We spent a whole day walking around and looked at all the wild foods out there and harvested things like nettles, fur tips, and spring greens that were out at the time and really started to get to know the nutrition levels of wild foods. I thought, this is exactly what I need to focus on. And ever since then, have been on this sort of wild foods parade. I joke that I went back to get my native degree from my people and so spent years traveling around studying with different elders from other tribes in the Coast Salish area, learning deeply about the meaning of food to our people. For Coast Salish people, food is not just a commodity or a resource to be extracted from the land. We consider our foods our greatest teachers, our culture, and that they show us how we're supposed to exist in this world. There are several examples I, I can give on how the salmon teach us about generosity and love and commitment to the future. The huckleberries, they're considered the blood of the earth, and they were gifted to us to be big medicine. And that we also have to think about how we can be big medicine in this world. When we learn to wake up every single day, asking ourselves how not just I can get all the protein and water in that I need in a day, how we collectively get enough food for everybody, how we collectively have access to clean drinking water. That is the shift we need to make so that we can be better nourished. What's what it's going to take to address the nutrition related diseases that exist at epidemic levels globally to truly address that. We have to start thinking more collectively. What Val said was really beautiful. We are connected from birth to our food system and see ourselves as stewards of it. It's our responsibility to give back. I watched a video about regenerative ag, and they talked about how much soil quality we really have for a healthy food system. When I hear this, it makes me think there's a fundamental understanding and maybe reconciliation that needs to happen in our conversation, which is about our beliefs and values. I think reciprocity is a huge part of it that probably isn't part of the food as medicine in the traditional way that we talk about it. 
compared to what you're saying. Can you tell me a little bit more reciprocity? Because I heard that. I think it goes with this individual versus collective, this relational understanding. I think that reciprocity dovetails really nicely into Coast Salish cultural values. I'm going to bring up generosity first, because I think that means something here. Just to go back to how our foods are our greatest teachers, when we talk about the life of a salmon and being really mindful and thinking through the journey that it takes to get to our plate, that a salmon is born in a freshwater stream and makes a journey out into the ocean, going on all kinds of adventures and manufacturing this body that's rich in minerals and omega-3 fatty acids and all the things that we need to feed our big brains and keep our bodies functioning well. Even our nervous system and our mental health, they're tied up in those specific nutrients that the salmon are out there collecting for us. And then they answer this call. They return to their ancestral rivers and enter those spaces with such dedication and commitment. They're bloodying their heads against dams doing everything they can to make it back to their ancestral spawning grounds with the understanding that they're going to give their life. They're going to spawn and they're going to die and their bodies will be used to feed the next generation. And we are the salmon nation. We see this as an excellent act of love and commitment to life eternal, generosity and reciprocity at the core. Those are the cultural values that Coast Salish people align themselves with. You're judged by your generosity, how much you can give. And we're giving with faith, knowing that our people will see that we're giving all we can and that they will also support us. We know that we'll take care of one another because that's what we see happening around us. It's a new way of thinking where humans are observing the ecosystem around us, that we're separate from it, but we're inextricably intertwined with our ecosystems. Humans play a major role. We have this superpower to destroy. We have a superpower to create and innovate. And we've always been interactive in our ecosystems, celebrating their generosity, the life that they give for us to have life, but also honoring the cycle of reciprocity. How do we give back? It is part of our teaching to keep it living. And so what do we do to keep it living? Just like everything around us supports us to keep us alive. And that is the core of reciprocity. And we receive that through honoring the generosity of things around us. Romajin, there's a sense of, I think, the reciprocity with non-human beings and land and respecting and honoring that. And I'm going to guide this conversation to talk about another important thing, which is about storytelling and how so much of what you're interacting with in the ecosystem is built around stories to capture the values and honoring them. What do you think from my understanding so far? I think Val did a beautiful job Mm -hmm. at sharing a few stories. I think storytelling has captured some of that food history. A lot of times, too, it was in traditional language, and there is a context and a value base inferred in that language that isn't there in English for us as generations move forward, things change. Well, what has been really consistent in my community, in my classroom, and in my kitchen are those stories, those underlying values, and our collective responsibility. The health of our environment is reflective of the health of our people. And so bringing that up and and reminding people is how we continue to carry that torch. So I think stories also call us to action. They empower us because they keep our knowledge. They are knowledge carriers. And then our storytellers bring that medicine to life through their gift. So I think storytelling is tremendously powerful. It has been an absolute gift and it is restorative as well because it's bringing us back to some of those traditional values. Thank you. I think now we've talked about food in a more holistic and some ways inspiring way and what it really means. For many Native communities, I want to continue the conversation to talk about what makes an Indigenous food system uniquely local and why is this important? Indigenous food systems are inherently local. They are regional, but that's also a, a slippery slope because there are extensive trading systems that have gone on for a very long time. 
here in this region, I'm thinking specifically about Muckleshoot, where we're eating a lot of seafood. There's land mammals, birds from the air, birds from the ground. There's underground bulbs. There's berries. So many berries, over a dozen different varieties of huckleberries grow here. Then everybody has their other favorites, like thimbleberry, salmonberry, and salal, and currants. So many fresh local foods here. In fact, over 300 different kinds of foods were consumed in an annual Coast Salish diet, which is very different from the standard American diet, which consists of up to 20 different foods. But also, some of those foods are responsible for creating things like, I'm thinking about ulican, which is this tiny little candlefish that were rendered for their fat. And it was common for a Coast Salish family to consume gallons of ulican oil every year. Ulican oil happens to be really high in vitamin D. And there are terms for it in our language that translate to something like sunshine food. Everybody in Washington state needs more vitamin D, right? There's this gift from the land. After that oil would be rendered off, it'd be put in boxes. Certain people would carry those boxes full of oil across the mountains. We call those the grease trails. Nowadays, it's called I-90 and I-5. These interstates were our old grease trails that were shaped from our food system, where it wasn't just so local, but also we were trading long distances. I think I'm struggling to understand how our food system has become a commodity and systematically shipped everywhere versus the local food movement of feeling like you can sustain yourself and getting connected to land. I think it's important to remember that the foods that are local here are providing for us what we need to get through the seasons, the seasonal change. And so it is important to prioritize feeding people here first. I see this all over the world. Global food systems do this who are not engaged in a hyper like commodified system. It's called cultural food pride. And we kind of do it in a sneaky way. I just went to Texas last year and they're really proud of their food. Here in the Northwest, we're really proud of our salmon, but we've just become more globally known for Starbucks. The salmon are important because they tell a story about the health of our land and waters. They subsequently feed the health of our people. They will cease to exist if we don't take care of our water and keep climate resilience in mind. Some salmon are literally being cooked as they're trying to return to their spawning grounds because the rivers are so low and the heat of the water is so high that they are unhealthy. And so we have to prioritize taking care of our land so that this species that's existed for thousands of years we're the generation facing this potential loss of the species that's been around for a long time. I don't want to be that type of ancestor. I want to be a good ancestor for the future. I want them to know that we tried everything we could to make sure that they knew what salmon tasted like and how to take care of it too. Yeah, again, they're just, they're more than resources to be extracted from the land. They shape our culture, our way of life, the way we think about things, the way we see the world. They feed us their medicine in so many ways, more than just omega-3 fats and minerals, even though I'm a science geek and I love those things too. I just think there's the spirit of the salmon that also feeds our spirit, and that is just as big of medicine. Thank you. I want to keep continuing to clarify the quote-unquote problem, right? What are we working with? The problem is food insecurity, nutrition-related diseases. Food insecurity, meaning there's lack of nutritious food for people. So we have to get food access to them somehow. And then nutrition related diseases, there's multiple problems there, but part of that is uh, access to nutritious food and education. That's what's so encouraging about Kaiser, the support and the, the emphasis and the platform that it's providing. It's an entity that cares and is trying to change the script and understands that there's a gap and a need there and trying to like really figure out what that is. And taking that community-driven approach, those are the elements necessary to make social change positive and sustainable. Our big challenge is that we've got to be really honest with the cost of living and the cost of production, not talking about what it truly costs to grow a bean to feed people. <laughs> and we're not really being honest about 
the dietary guidelines and what people really need. If I'm looking at my ancestor's diet, a Coast Salish ancestor would be eating nettles and berries, good quality cold water fish, and wild game whose bodies were constructed from the land. We know that we're being fed to feel full, but we're not really getting enough nutrition to truly feed us. So we become what my good buddy Raj Patel would say is stuffed and starved. We're still hungry inside. Being exposed to a lifetime of nutrition deficiencies leads to all of the diseases that we're seeing in in our country now that are completely preventable. If we were just fed better, it's if we just had access to good quality nutrition, like diabetes and heart disease and certain types of cancers that all derive from malnutrition. Romajin, what has it felt like the healthcare entity wherever you interact with talking about nutrition with diabetes versus Mm -hmm. what Native communities have taught you? This thing of internal community knowledge. As a diagnosed type 1 diabetic, I was very unique. It is still something that they don't know a ton about as far as how it happens. The management has been a tough conversation. It's not generally a holistic conversation. It has taken me a long time to build the individuals around me to be advocates, to hear what I'm saying, to champion. Since I was born, my family has really immersed me in my tribal community values. That is linked to food sovereignty, food as medicine. I did this because I wasn't finding answers in traditional health care. It was like, take another medicine, try this Western remedy. But it was never, let's focus on your nutrition. Let's talk to the root of it. Let's talk about what in your genetics your body might not be doing well with. We aren't having the conversations about how to remedy this. Getting out and burning calories and growing your own food, the way that really feeds our body, the way that really helps us to manage our own ailments, those aren't conversations that are being had. I had to seek that out in my community through food sovereignty, not because we're experts. We're very new to diabetes. However, there is traditional knowledge that speaks to these very things because we're preventative medicine people. We knew that the medicine from the seasons would prepare us for the season change and the next season. We were doing those things through the seasons, eating what was appropriate, building ourselves up. We had very mineral-rich diet, really supporting that. And so we were very much preventative medicine people. Right now, we're more subscriptive. We're dealing with things that come up. Rather than saying, this food is going to lift up my heart, help my blood flow, cleanse my system, pull the toxins out of my body. Healthcare wasn't having the conversation about food and how that is linked to a lot of healthcare issues, particularly diabetes. We're not talking about a restorative food system and restorative health. I got my insulin and education around that, but I've really had to seek nutrition education or my own food sovereignty on my own. And with awesome people like Valerie and in my tribal community and in our larger food community. Yeah. Folks really want to be supportive. That's what I know about our food systems. There's a paternalistic idea that's pervasive in healthcare that we have a belief on how to get you better. It is to get your insulin to the right dose, Romajin, and then you'll be fine. You're just not listening to us. And then now the problem in our mind is, how do we convince you this is the right way? And if you're not listening, what else can we do to convince you? Versus really meeting you where you're at. We mentioned the word food sovereignty a bunch. I would like actually just for both of you to say in your own words what it means to you. As a type 1 diabetic, I found my own meaning to food sovereignty. For me, and the way I share it in my classroom is, it is our ability to know what we're putting in our body and where it comes from. Simply and wholly. A lot of times reading a label, I don't know that. If I hold up an orange and I hold up an Oreo, I bet you know what's in the orange. There might be some questions about what's in that Oreo. I like that. I know it makes sense, right? Valerie, what about you? Food sovereignty is the ability to decide what you want to eat. When we're collectively making that decision, shaping our food system. If we choose to eat more cauliflower, guess what's going to be in the grocery store shelves? More cauliflower. 
So we have the ability to, to every single day when hunger grows inside of us, which happens several times a day for us humans, we have the awesome opportunity to, cha- to change the food system and to shape it. And we are exerting food sovereignty by doing that. Thank you. I like both of those definitions. Mm-hmm. I want to transition to Feed Seven Generations on your vision for what a better food system looks like. And what does that work look like for you? Feed Seven Generations was born out of the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, which Roma Jean also knows very well. Her and I bonded over it, leading several initiatives through our grad program together. So does my partner, Louis Angaro. Him and I founded. We were holding some of the first workshops around the Food Sovereignty Project in Muckleshoot. And that looked like how to skin a deer and cook it and can it over a fire, how to fillet a salmon. What is the story of this specific type of salmon? Holding full day seminars on certain types of foods. And it grew into several different initiatives. There was the genetically engineered salmon campaign that the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project led as an opposition to the creation and marketing of genetically engineered salmon, which was passed by resolution by the Muckleshoot Tribal Council and moved up to the National Congress of American Indians so that all of an Indian country had opposed the production of genetically engineered salmon. It also became a, a ridiculous amount of food curriculum, like food and medicine curriculum. So we're at over 900 pages now. We've just recently counted all these different curriculum sets that help take a culturally relevant approach to nutrition. After piloting and co-designing with the Muckleshoot community for over a decade, it was time to share those resources with other communities. Really, those communities are our relatives. I'm just as much Swinomish and Suquamish and Snoqualmie as I am Muckleshoot. And Roma Jean can say (laughs) the same thing about tribes in Oregon. We wanted to share these resources with our relatives as efficiently as possible and support other initiatives around our region and throughout the country. Feed Seven Generations is really about getting the word out, helping to strengthen food sovereignty. The mission is in the name. We are trying to push forward an agenda that helps to truly feed the seventh generation and beyond. Yeah, in 2020, we came into the pandemic working for our tribe. A lot of things shifted for a lot of people, like the world shut down. But what continued is our need for really good nutrition, for having food that really built up our immune system. And that was really where we shine. That's really where we were at in our community. I came on board full time. Um, I left the tribe in the sense that I left my position and came on to feed full time. We have just been running ever since, continuing to do work, listening to our community, really trying to lift up those values and power community food projects and empower individuals in their own food sovereignty, community gardens, regenerative agriculture, direct food access during the pandemic. And of course, food is medicine in the way that harvesting ethics, having individuals directly on the land, and then whatever we're harvesting, having education around how to process it and utilize it to uplift your health. We have lots of native infusion beverages. So we try to start in a way that it's accessible to everybody, really empowered to uplift our own health from the store outside our door, what we see on our landscape. That has always been lifting us up since time immemorial. We just have to remember how to use it. Thank you. I want to do a rapid round of programs that's emphasized on your communication. So first is Native Plants and Foods Curriculum. Tell us briefly what that is. The Native Plants and Foods Curriculum is a suite of materials. We have several curriculum sets that were born out of requests from the community. One of them is the Native Infusion Rethink Your Drink curriculum, which is about uh, increasing knowledge and awareness around ancestral beverages and that they were healthy beverages, that our ancestors drank a lot of fresh, clean water from the mountain spring and oftentimes included plants like nettle, wild rose, and dug fir tree tips. Those beverages were incredibly nutritious and healthy as well. One cup of nettle tea 
is an entire calcium supplement. Your body doesn't have to try to break down the pill. It's absorbing calcium, iron, magnesium, chlorophyll, and other things our body uses to manufacture blood. It's just nettle tea, and it's right outside your door. That's an example of our curriculum and approach that we take. We're thinking about what's generally recognized as safe. We are only sharing plants that we know there's an abundance of and that they're safe to harvest. Every one of these curriculum sets are set up to be able to pick up and teach on your own. But joining a training helps stand it up a little bit. It gives you a little kickstand to keep those teachings held up. We also have the Cedar Box Teaching Toolkit that is really about featuring oh, 13 quintessential Northwest Native foods, foods like duck, deer and elk and clams and mussels and oysters, wild strawberries in there, nettles are in there, camas, cattail. I could go on with the whole list, but that curriculum actually also lives on the OSPI, the Office for Superintendent of Public Instruction website for the state of Washington to help common schools teach about native foods derived from here. Ramajin, what is native ground and gather? Yes, native grown and gather. There's a native grown and gather landing page on feed generationorg Native grown and gathered is a community-based project. It was born from wanting to source from Indian country. We know when we vote with our dollars, purchasing from our producers inside of our own food system, we're lifting up our Muckleshoot food system. During the pandemic, when we were thinking about where we were sourcing things, we wanted to source local. We're in a food desert in Muckleshoot. We're quite far, especially without reliable transportation from good grocery stores that have the things you need. We wanted to make sure that when we were able to spend money on food, that it went back into Indian country. Lifting up our own food economy, we found that was quite a feat. We had to do a lot of work to find producers and source just one single grocery bag. So Native Grown and Gathered was born from that. Where are our tribal producers? How do we access them? What is it that they need to uplift their business? And how can we use our resources, such as Feed7Generations.org, to be a platform? So we went out, did interviews, located tribal producers, put them on one document. It will be a, a full web page soon, but they're on one beautiful flipbook on the um, Native Grown and Gathered pay, landing page on Feed7. We wanted to be able to spend our dollars in Indian country. We wanted people to be able to source. But the other thing I think we talked about is food is medicine. Sometimes we need that ulakin, but it's a feat to go out there and catch those. They're being overfished. You might not know where to get them. If we were able to find somebody out there harvesting, they're just an expert at it. They're also producing it and you're able to purchase that oil. And that's really going to give you power, that vitamin D or that sunshine medicine. We're able to put someone on there that might be able to connect you with that. Particular teas, local medicines, connecting somebody with a producer that's up in the mountains harvesting those 12 different kinds of huckleberries. It is the start of an e-commerce space for native producers. And it also pushes back a little bit on local. So they said, okay, let's find all your native producers in King County. Our Ulican doesn't necessarily come from King County. Maybe our elk does and some of our berries do, but we have relatives outside of King County. We have Snoqualmie relatives in our county, but there's lots of other tribes. We pushed that and said local looked a little different, but we were getting around and definitely had a vibrant barter and trading system. We had a vibrant tribal economy. They have grown and ga gathered is trying to recapture that. We encourage people to get some Tulsu bud honey from a Puyallup tribal vendor. As an individual person can do that, but also it can go to market and it could be featured in a store. But also if you're that tribal person and need that medicine specific to your community, you might be able to find that as well. It's a beautiful magazine online right now and has some recipes too. So check it out. The next part that I want to dive deep into is the indigenous youth. I think it's part of the vision of Feats of Generation of educating our youth and getting them actively harvesting, understanding seasonality. Tell me a little bit more about that. We have been lucky. Kaiser has helped lift up our Feed 7 gener Generations Youth Ambassadors. We've really wanted to lift that up, but it really took the structure and being able to develop out an intern program. 
and to have enough staff to be at the school. For us, we know that our youth are our future. And I tell the youth all the time when we're at the school, you're going to take my job. I mean it. Like, I want one of you individuals in this classroom to be doing this work. So we absolutely see it as really building up the legacy work, passing on the traditional values that have been passed on to us. And there are next land stewards. There are next food sovereignty warriors. Lovely. Now I'm going to bring in the foodist medicine movement in healthcare as currently defined. It is like a pyramid where the top of the pyramid being really sick folks, the middle being people who are at risk, and then bottom being population level. Now we're going to role play. Imagine you're in a conversation of somebody who's designing it for a healthcare system who's saying, we're going to design this strategy to serve our communities. And I want to know what, as a native community, you would say for somebody designing it at each level. So let's say the highest level is people are living with chronic disease and high utilization. I want to create medically tailored meals sent to your home. What concerns would you have with that strategy? And what advice would you give for somebody designing a program like that? My concern for that strategy would be being able to be active in a food system that when we're actively out there on the land pursuing wild game or fishing the rivers or even taking care of a garden, we receive gifts. There's another level of nourishment that comes along with that. It arrives in the form of memories where you might be out there in the garden remembering the way your grandmother used to prune those bushes or the way your grandpa used to cultivate those turnips. You know, I'm just talking about any food that's growing at this point. We miss that opportunity if something is just being handed to us. It's like teaching a person to fish versus giving them the fish. It is a thoughtful gift. We live in a time where not everybody can afford to take time off or the gasoline to drive to those places. That is a real challenge. There is an opportunity to balance both of them. And going back to the youth work, all kids want to do is be on screens. All they care about is video games. When the youth are out there active in this system, they are engaged. They are excited. They are telling everybody about it. They want to do this work. They feel a sense of belonging and purpose. Being active in that food system reminds them of who they are and where they come from, and that's medicine. And all of those opportunities can be taken away by that type of an approach, even though it is well-intended. I agree completely, Val. In our Muckleshoot community, we did have the opportunity to do meal kit deliveries and bring beautiful salmon fillets into homes. What we realize is part of why we do these things in community is because we understand the social importance. It's also bridging the gap of the generations. When someone is getting those meals delivered, there's not that interaction with the food system, but also there might be the lack of social engagement. Part of the storytelling and the joy and the reciprocity, like the recipe sharing, happens in that engagement. I love the idea of medically tailored meals, especially if they meet those social and cultural needs. That would be my thing, thinking about it through that social and cultural lens. Perfect. The next one is about diet-related risks, specifically produce prescriptions, which is this is what you should eat. Here's what you should buy. When I say that, what does it make you think of? There are troubles with telling people what they can and cannot purchase. It does not help strengthen food sovereignty. It is another model of superimposing a diet on somebody. Part of their healing journey is to develop a relationship with food that helps us to slow down and think about, you know, the mindfulness that's required to think about the source of the food and where it came from. Never before in human history have we been this far removed from our food system and the source of our food. And so getting back to that is really important. I value the approach that WIC takes, for example, While I have my own interpretations and criticisms of the recommended dietary allowance and the dietary guidelines, I admire the way WIC takes a preventative approach. I think it's important. I have been in a lot of conversations with uh, WIC and Native mothers 
who find it problematic that our traditional foods are not available or listed on their sites. And that's simply because of a packaging snafu. It's hard to get salmon because salmon isn't packaged in a certain type of way to be WIC certified. That overlooking and overstepping of an entire preferred diet that is very nutritious and will help to shape the taste buds of the next generation is really important to consider with those prescriptive diets. I have some folks who have shared with me a service called Over the Counter. It is supplementary to any other benefits they might get, but it's specific for produce. It really makes their budget stretch. It is nice to um, specifically be able to purchase fresh foods because the trade-off often comes with things that go in the freezer. And we know that they're going to be higher in sodium and all of these types of things. And so I have heard really good things. Not every program is going to be the same, but they find that access to fresh quality produce tends to be really expensive. And that is what's sacrificed, especially if it ends up going bad in your fridge. So having those types of benefits and a little bit of education around how to keep your food healthy or fresh longer seems to, they really seem to be liking it. It's something I just heard about this year, but it's definitely something in the community that I heard. Not that it has to be prescriptive because nobody loves that, but at least when it looks like an added benefit. Perfect. The last layer, I think there's a rich conversation to be had here for everybody. Consumer education often for people means package labeling, menu labeling, and how to understand percentage of RDA or a dietary allowance. Yes, we developed a poster titled Feed Seven Generations. It was built out of a request from an elder, Hank Gobin from Tulalip. When I first started this work, I was really excited. He was one of the folks I studied with and was generous with his time and teachings. And he looked at me one day and was like, are we going to help our people eat their traditional food or eat more like their ancestors when our common harvesting grounds are Safeway and QFC? What do we tell people as they're going through the grocery store? That's what the Feed Seven Generations poster is really all about, our traditional foods principles. Traditional foods are local foods. They're seasonal foods. When we're eating things that are in season, we're eating foods at their peak vitality. They're higher in nutritional value and help us attune to the shifting environment around us. They are whole foods, which means they consist of one ingredient. Going back to Roma Jean's comparison of an orange and Oreo, where do we <laughs> harvest Oreos in nature? <laughs> There's no shrubs or trees that produce those things. And thinking about a food in that way and through that lens while you're shopping around the grocery store, we're really trying to break it down and simplify it and just like kind of funny self-reflective practices, but really like shopping with your ancestor. What would they recognize as food? Probably nothing that comes in a cereal box or in sterilized plastic. You don't need a scientific degree to eat healthy. If you don't know what that scientific word is on the package, maybe we don't need to eat it. That's what <laughs> the, the food principles are all about. Love it. Any final takeaways, call to action? I just want to say that this movement, while it is Indigenous-led and a deep part of our healing process from the effects of colonization, really means making the invisible visible again. It's going to take all of us to create a food system that truly feeds the future. The success of that hinges on how well we honor these old food traditions and remember, it's our time to carry them, perfect them, and hand them off to the next generation. We can't rely on anybody else to do that. All of us, we all have to do that. No matter what population or demographic you represent, everybody needs to be a part of this. This is really about feeding the future successfully and really well. We're not going to heal in this generation, but we're going to hope that our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and, and people we will have, have never met will be fed better in the future. Thank you. Yeah, please go to feed7generations.org. And we really think accessibility is important. And so we have worked really hard to have resources that are accessible to really empower you to go out and take control of your food system. Check out our website. 
check out some of the free resources. If, if you know outdoor educators, there's a beautiful portal. It has all those curriculum materials. It just takes a little bit of reading and making sure that you want to access that. We want things to be accessible, low barrier, and we want everybody to be healthy. We want, you know, our food system to be vibrant and we want our environment to be vibrant. And that is for all of us. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much. As always, thank you for listening to Healthcare for Humans. If you have found any value in this podcast, I have two quick requests. One, please leave a review in the podcast app that you're listening to my voice in right now. It really helps others discover the show. Two, share this episode with anyone who you think might benefit from it. For easy access to all our episodes and to support the podcast, visit www.healthcareforhumans.org. There you'll find our content clearly organized by topics, countries, themes, to help you choose what to listen to next. Until next time, this is Dr. Raj Sundar, reminding you that culturally responsive care leads to better patient outcomes. See you again soon.